Hello friends and welcome to the Fox's Dojo. This is my research centre, my uh, my home if you like, where I do all of my UFC work. So it's a new year, 2019, hope it's going well for you. And I thought that I would try some new stuff given the new year. Coming up, we have UFC Fight Night Brooklyn. So I asked you guys what questions you would like to ask me. Would you like to hear some of my thoughts on certain things? And you responded very positively. So I have a whole host of questions about this fight night in Brooklyn. TJ Dillashaw looking to become a double champ. He faces Henry Cejudo who landed that crazy uh, that crazy underdog victory in 2018 against longtime champ Demetrius Johnson. Now... I've got a lot of questions about that one, then the rest of card, then other couple of uh, questions outside of the realms of this weekend. So I'm going to try and cover them all. I'm going to name check them. I'm going to try and blast through them. But thank you already. I'll do that. A big thank you to everyone. So I don't keep doing that. Cause that'll get annoying. And let's get on with it. So Connor Fowler, do you think moving down a weight class to be a double champ holds the same prestige as moving up? How do you compare TJ pushing the limits of his body versus McGregor, DC and Nunes going up to fight in brackets on paper, physically bigger champions? Wow, well, yeah, he's going to be in some serious company there. And it's, it's horrible comparing. It really is. But it depends who you're fighting. BJ Penn might say something about that whole prestige regarding uh, the weight classes and whether you're fighting up or going down. I think it depends a lot on who, who you're taking the belt from. Cejudo is a two-sport champion. He is an Olympic gold medalist. And he beat, he beat arguably, the GOAT. So he's got a tough challenge ahead of him. Is there as much prestige as perhaps Daniel Cormier going up and becoming the light heavyweight champion and then the heavyweight champion, beating Stipe Miocic, who was a record-breaking heavyweight champion. Is there as much prestige as that? I don't know. It depends on the fashion. And it, I think there needs to be a little bit more that we consider about their careers as well. When you look at Nunes, for example, she's the greatest of all time when it comes to female uh, mixed martial artists, right? Chris Cyborg and her record, then you put it together with what she's done. So there's a little bit more to it than that. I don't think that TJ becomes like the the top double champ, if you like, straight away after this. So, uh, But there's going to be more about that because there's some other interesting questions. Terry Two Pints and Matthew Brend, they talk about the same sort of theme. Do you think the UFC is simply waiting to see how this fight plays out before making a decision on the future of the flyweight division? Also, if TJ wins, will we ever see him back at flyweight? If you listen to interviews with uh, TJ's coaches, I don't think that he's going to be sticking around at flyweight. But who knows? I think that he has ambition, ambitions elsewhere. Do, do I think the UFC is simply waiting to see how this fight plays out? Well, they signed Joe Benavidez to a four-fight contract. Apparently, he wasn't speaking about any ambitions at 135. So now that the dust has settled a little bit from all the headlines around the flyweight division, let's see. Let's see. I don't know if they're pinning everything on that, but let's see how this works out. I personally would like to see 125 continue. Jack Elridge... Uh, and the guys at the Split Decision podcast. Do you think either Dillashaw or Cejudo would be interesting or interested at a fight against Max Blessed Holloway? I do. I think that that is what Dillashaw's team would like to see him do next. That would then enable him to become a, a fighter that has won belts in three different weight classes. That is insane. And what a fight that would be as well. I I would love to see that fight if indeed TJ gets through Cejudo on the weekend. Uh, a treble champ. will ah. So if TJ isn't the guy to become a treble champ, is there anyone else that could potentially become a, a treble champ? Yeah. Look, the record's are being broken all the time. Why not? And actually, I think in the future, as the sport grows, as the UFC develops... There are going to be more weight divisions. They'll be closer together and therefore there is more opportunity for treble, triple champions. How exciting is that? Who will be the first? Will it be Dillashaw? Dustin Love. 
Right, if either TJ or Cejudo miss weights, would the UFC be handed, handed a nail in a coffin it needs, might even want, to publicly announce the news it's dissolving flyweights? And if both fighters are at least 126 pounds, if TJ agreed, could they fight for the 135 pound belt January 19th? I honestly don't believe that the UFC are crossing any fingers for that. They don't like controversy like that. People missing weight, things of that nature. No, the UFC don't want that to happen. Um, so no, they're, they're, I don't think there's any m motivation there or any desire for something like that to happen so that they can put this division to bed. I, I really don't think it's like that. If both fighters are at least 100 so basically, will, will they suddenly change this into a bantamweight title? No, I don't think that will happen either. I, I really don't think that that will happen. Crazier things have happened though, right? But no, I don't think that's in the plans at all. There's a lot of things that have got to happen for that to happen, and, and I don't think we're there. Uh, M. Bristow, do you think the weight cut will affect Dillashaw's performance? If so, how? I don't know if Dillashaw or his team know how he's going to be affected. They've never gotten all the way down to 125. I think I've heard him in interviews say that you don't do that on a test cut. You only go so far before you, if you do the water weight thing, the water loading, then that's the last part. So I don't think he knows. So I certainly don't know. But it's a concern and they're going to be very much hoping that he carries everything forward, carries his power, speed, stamina all the way down to 125. But it sounds like they've done a test cut before to a certain extent. And listen, uh, there's going to be other other questions around this as well. TJ Dillashaw is a smart fighter, surrounded by smart people who have been in this fight game a long time. He has the resources as well to invest in a good team. And I think when we talk about people moving around weight divisions and doing these kind of funky moves in their career. If we have a look at where they're coming from, what teams and their history, sometimes that can give us an indication of the trouble that may lie ahead. But I think that he's he's someone that you can trust. His team is a team that you can trust as well. So I think he'll make that weight, but I don't know how he's going to perform. I really don't. It's it's certainly a risk and he's looking very lean at the moment, but he believes he's there, so we shall see. Not long to go. Josh Barnes says, who would you have on standby if either fighter in the main event doesn't make, I guess, weights? And your thoughts on the UFC having no backup for their first card on ESPN? Again, it's a, it's a bit of a negative one, this, and... I mean, there's a whole host of ranked fighters on the card. What have we got? Like eight ranked fighters, um, two champions. So there's they, they've got a, a pretty good weighting on this card. Now, the backup, well, Joe Benavidez, ranked number two, he's on this card and so is Dustin Ortiz. So if anything really terrible happens in that main event, you do have guys there that could step up. We have seen that in the past. I know it would ruin the opportunity potentially for someone else. Otherwise, you know, Hernandez Cerrone is a fight that could headline elsewhere. So yeah, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. But let's focus on the positives, shall we? Hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, Sports Guru and UHL underscore 6200 and then a really long name. John, how do you feel cutting the extra 10 pounds will affect TJ's strength, especially in potential grappling exchanges? Is he on track? Again, I don't know if he's on track. He's saying he's on track since he's nearly there now. Um, do I feel like cutting that extra 10 pounds will affect his strength? Um, it's a small... These... Just in percentage terms, these smaller weight classes, I, I do I do think it will affect his strength and I, and I do think it will affect his uh, his conditioning. Will that therefore affect his strategy? Probably. Will his team be safe on that? Probably. Uh, so, yeah, I think they're going to have to... There's This will have to be quite scientific, not only in the way that he makes the weight, but also the way they put this strategy together in order to have a successful fight. 
Do you think the result on Saturday night will have any positive influence on the flyweight division or are we just going to have to get used to the idea of a UFC with no flyweight division? I like the flyweights, I really do. I think they're very exciting, very technical. And if we get an exciting technical bout, then will that have a positive influence on the division? Yeah, I would imagine it probably will do. If it's a if it's a, a bad, bad fight, will it have a negative effect on the division? I don't know. You've also got uh, Benavidez and Ortiz if they have a, a blistering bout. So I, I don't think everything hangs on this. Although Cejudo's pursuing that line, isn't he? Saying that he's fighting for the divisions, which is quite interesting. And it's going to it's gonna get all the guys around him because his foes, if you like, are now pulling for him in this in this fight potentially but i really don't i really don't read into that too much rest of card jan van den boss right he is talking about Medeiros. don't you think Medeiros is getting underrated coming into this fight which weight class All right let's let's uh let's go into that one yeah, listen, Medeiros is, a, is an interesting one from a, a great camp in Hawaii. Scrappy fighter, very, very tough. He's <clears throat> fighting a ranked opponent, though, this time uh, in Gregor Gillespie. I haven't seen a lot of talk around him, you know, that, that he's going to be starched or anything like that. So I'm not, I'm not sure what you've read around that one. Which weight class is best for Cerrone at this time? That's interesting because Cerrone's a big guy. He's gone up to welterweight. It hasn't worked out for him. Welterweight is a very competitive division. Always has been. As has lightweight. Now he's going to try and come back down to lightweight in more senior years within his career after having felt what it was like, uh, you know, at 170. Listen, this is the decision that he's made. He's a true pro. He's been there many times before. So he obviously feels like lightweight is going to be a bit better for him. Maybe it's the the impetus that he needs to really kick on in his training and, and change things up. He's been at this for such a long time. So he and his team are very experienced. They know what they're doing. If he feels better at 155, then go for it. If he feels like he is going to be more successful at 155. Again, he's got to go for it because he hasn't got many years left or many fights left, I should say. Uh, that, for Cerrone, I'm not sure what that actually means because he can fight like eight times in a year if he really wanted to. So, uh, so yeah, I don't know. I don't, it's He's had to play around with his body a fair bit, though, over the years. I'm sure he's used to it, but it, it is a little concerning. Let's see how he looks because he's got a super tough fight on his hands. Uh, will flyweight still exist after this weekend? I've been talking about that. Which fight is your favourite this weekend? Ah, okay, my favourite. Let's have a look very quickly. I really like that Hernandez Cerrone fight. Hernandez is someone who looks phenomenal. You know, he's he's really well built for that weight class. He brings a very exciting style. He's very smart as well, and it's kind of a bit of a similar storyline coming up against Cerrone when you look at Cerrone's past fights fighting these young contenders, these young up-and-comers who are really making a lot of noise. So it's a risky fight again for Cerrone. Hernandez is the real deal. I, I was really high on this kid when I first saw him. I think he's like, what, 26 now? So uh, Cerrone's going to need to be on his game. This kid's coming with aggression, and he can finish the fight anywhere. A real new breed of mixed martial artists. But we saw in Cerrone's last fight, he can still get it done. He can get it done anywhere as well. And and now with his, his baby, so he, he looks like a, a bit of a new man, but we shall see. This is a, it's a very interesting fight. I like that a lot. I like the Joanne Calderwood, Ariane Lipsky fight, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. What else do I like? Yeah, I mean, that, the main event, uh, we got uh, Jeff Neal, Bilal Mohammed. That is absolute money, that fight. That is brilliant. So uh, I'm going to come on to some of those, but there's a couple for you. Do you think Till will headline UFC London? Uh, he could do. I really don't know what's going on there. I, I heard an interview on Fight Disciples with Till talking about fighting, you know, a guy in the top five, and I'm not sure who's available. So um, it seems unlikely if he's going to hold out for the big fights. 
Right, another one is 155, the right division for Cerrone. I think we just covered that. Andrew Parrish, thank you. Nick Long, what are your honest thoughts of not only Greg Hardy being on this card, but in the co-main event? <clears throat> Those two men have a combined 15 pro fights between them. They are the co-main event for the first ever ESPN card. This is a difficult one. In the UK, I, I didn't know a great deal about Greg Hardy. It has caused a lot of rumblings. I've read that and I fully understand that. Uh, about him being a co-main event athlete, well, if someone's getting a lot of eyeballs it, from a promotional standpoint, it makes sense to sort of push them in that realm, especially if they're fighting at home or, or if they have a fan base that will be attending uh, the arena because fans will stick around. So it actually adds to the whole event the broadcast as well. Now, here's my thing, and I was I was listening to a radio broadcast about this the other day, and it was geared towards R. Kelly, and they were talking about whether radio or this particular radio station show DJ should or will be playing R. Kelly records after what came out about him. And the DJ was like, he won't. He's never going to play him when he's on the road. He's never going to play him on the radio. He's kind of ruined it. What he's done is monstrous. So uh, he's, he's a criminal and it's absolutely vile. And it made me think about, obviously we're not talking about the same crimes as R. Kelly there. And I'm not saying that they're the same, but they're, they're grave crimes sometimes that we're experiencing with some of our sports stars. And should we still celebrate them? Do we give combat sports athletes a bit of a pass sometimes? Um I'm not sure where I'm at with all of this, if I'm honest, because I do get affected by seeing some of the bad things that uh, athletes have done and, and yet they still get opportunities. I don't know how I feel if they've served their time, this, that and the other. You know, if I saw Mike Tyson walking down the street, uh, you know, the man had been in prison uh, and was guilty of some some terrible things. Would I try and shake his hand and would I be in awe of being in his presence? I probably would. Um, so I'm I'm not sure honestly that you ask me honestly I just don't know how to answer it and I I don't know where my head's at with with all of that stuff as well. Um, right, fight of the night prediction. All right, let's let's get into the the Jeff Neal Bilal Muhammad because that could be one of them. Um, Neal was supposed to fight on UFC Adelaide, so I did a bit of research around him and I really liked what I saw. Um, he was fighting Luke Jamo on that card. Now he gets a really seasoned opponent in Bilal Muhammad who can really help elevate him if indeed he comes away with a win. Muhammad's on a hot streak as well, however, and he's very, very tough to put away. Neil's a, a proven finisher. I think he's got like a, a, a bunch of finishes. I can't remember exactly how many. I apologize. I should have been better prepared. Uh, he's got a, a lot of finishes under his belt two in the UFC if I'm correct and I don't think Muhammad's lost in a couple of years so um, he's going to be up for this one he's fighting out of a good team I like that fight a lot uh, I was again referring to this earlier uh, Adri uh, Ariane Ariane Lipsky I'm going to get that right versus Jojo Calderwood Oh, that's fire as well. Um, Jojo seems happy at 125. She got that win that she so desperately needed. I know that straw weight was very tough for her. Looking behind the curtain, I saw that weight cut. It was not pleasant. So, so this is good for her. She seems happy in Vegas as well. I'm very pleased for her. But she has got a very interesting fight ahead of her. Lipsky trains in Kudachiba. There's some Polish descendants in her bloodline. And so she then got picked up by KSW, a huge promotion in Poland. And she earned her stripes over there. Very tough circuit indeed. She's shown, she's shown it everywhere. Striking, uh, grappling. She's on a hell of a win streak. I think like nine fights, eight finishes. She's got very, very good Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And that is where we've seen Joanne Calderwood fall down on occasion yes it might be because it's been set up in certain other ways but I think that could be a big a big thing for her especially if if it's a very spirited Calderwood who comes in there looking for that stand-up battle but then a sneaky takedown comes in and, and she gives up a, a position it could be an early night but that 
should be a really, really good fight. I think we're going to see a lot of action there. I, I hope so. And, and I'm excited for that one. Um, on the theme of other then. So who do you consider to be the current best pound for pound fighter in the world? <laughs> That's such a tough question. Right now, I'm going to go with Daniel Cormier. I really, I admire the guy and I think what he did by going up to heavyweight and taking out Stipe Miocic was incredible. He took out everyone else apart from John Jones at light heavyweight. That is a little bit of a stain. <clears throat> that aside, he's done it. John Jones isn't too weight yet. And as I was saying before, you know, can I erase from my memory <clears throat> everything that's happened with John Jones? Should that affect the pound for pound status? I, I don't know. Should it affect Hall of Fame status? I don't know. It's a difficult one. Anyway, that, that wasn't exactly what I was asked. I'm going to go with DC. So uh, that was Sam Wallace as well. Uh, Fabian, silly question. Right, this is a different one. But how does this new ESPN Plus work in the UK? Do we download the app? Do we get access to all cards and pay-per-view on the app? Do we still need BT Sports? Are all the cards available on BT Sport? Blah, blah, blah. Right, I'm going to just say this. BT Sport have this fight night this weekend on BT Sport 2. It is going to be live. I mean, by all means, download the app. I think it's free, but... BT Sport, from what I understand, they've taken the UFC package, the the feed that we get that goes out with you know commentary when I'm lucky enough to be to be there, and that is going to be what's broadcast. So stick with your BT Sport subscription. I think you get, that's where you're going to find the fights if you're in the UK and Ireland. I hope that's answered it. Uh, check your listings, um, and we'll see how things develop there. But right now, yeah, I think it's all about BT Sport for the UK fans. Sam Vickery, what are your thoughts on the Greg Hardy situation this weekend? Uh, Sam, I think I've answered that as well. Sean Fadden, what's going on, Sean? Uh, all the way from snowy Colorado. Don't forget to talk about my man, Corey Sandhagen, and how he's the future of the bantamweight division. Well, what an exciting fighter he is, first of all. His fight with Alcantara was unbelievable. He had his arm bent backwards at well, every possible way it can be bent and then came back and really put it on Alcantara and, and took that, that win home. Two fights now in the UFC, two finishes, I believe, um, in two different weight classes. So he's exciting, tall as well. I think he's like 5'11". Um, Four-fight win streak, all by stoppage. I wanted to say that's the guy who was supposed to fight John Lineker. That hasn't uh, come to fruition. Now he gets um, uh, Mario Bautista, an MMA lab guy, who's also... Like crazy good, uh, unbeaten, maybe 6-0. and They both come up on the LFA promotion. So that's also quite interesting that they, they never met before. They are only meeting one another now. Um, and uh, Bautista's only seen the judges' scorecards once. So he's, you know, he's, he's a good prospect. So that's a, a tough fight for him. But I would have really liked to have seen that Lineker fight. That would have, like, made him jump all the way up to the top right there. Um, I can't pronounce this guy's name all in one. I don't know how it's uh, broken down, but I'm going to read the question. My question is early prelims are on ESPN plus prelims are on ESPN. Then the main card is on ESPN plus again. Why can't UFC and the network stop this kind of confusion? I don't think it's the UFC, by the way. I think that is, well, the UFC designed the cards in a certain way so that you have your, your fight pass prelims, prelims, and then main card. And that has allowed networks to I guess put them on different channels in different ways for different marketing to hook people in so that if they have different levels of subscription they can still see some UFC fights so it might be a bit of a marketing ploy I'm not sure that is a question for the scheduling guys down at ESPN I, I appreciate that it's it's a bit confusing but I mean, what what is it nowadays? You know, you're just skipping over a channel, so man, just just follow that along. It's not like you don't get noticed. So I get what you're saying, streamline it and all the rest of it. But it will allow people when we go forward to pay per views to see some content for free. I guess if you have 
that on your subscription package if it is there for free probably not then um, but that's what it's all about subscription non-subscription pay-per-view money that's the world that we live in my friend uh, Ethan Kent not related to Brooklyn but is Darren Till fighting in London and will you be commentating for the London event you bet your bottom dollar Dan and I will be comment, uh, commentating in London I can't, however, bet any dollars right now on Darren Till fighting in London. I mean, he's got to be, right? He's got to be. He's in training. We've seen that. And if he is there, then, I mean, he's a candidate for a main event. But I, I don't know, man. I'd love to see him there. I hope they can make a fight for him. It's got to It's got to make sense for his career. The guy has just fought for a title. Uh, but... You know, that's uh, I'd love to call. I'd love to call another Darren Till fight. Good, good to see that guy as well. And uh, th- there will be a lot of welterweights that will be looking to fight him. Or will he go up to middleweight and wait out his opportunity at welterweight? I am not so sure. All right, that was the bunch of questions. I hope that answered them for you and you enjoyed this. I am also going to be putting out a video. Probably it's with someone else right now to see what they think of it, and they might put it out on their platform it's a little bit faster moving it's jam-packed full of info so look out for that because i want your feedback both on this and the other video that i've got if you haven't therefore subscribed please do so i very much appreciate that more content definitely coming your way last year was a bit stop start i had a baby um, so you have to excuse me for that and then i had to pretty much rebuild my home so all of my plans for bringing you guys more content behind the scenes um, and right there in, on the coal face as well, going over to meet fighters. That is still very much in play. Just looking to uh, etch out that time. But I've got some plans for this year. This is one of them. Uh, so keep tuned in to the Journey of Discovery podcast and my socials at John Gooden UK. Thank you very much. Catch you next time.